thanks everybody for coming down this morning. I really appreciate you can make the time and I hope you're going to have some interesting conversations around your table and Hamish has kindly offered his time to come and talk to us from his perspective. Lots of, lots of big websites and uh, I'll hand over to you and you'll introduce yourself. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So good morning all, I'm Hamish McFadden. My background, so I've been working in the technology world for about 20 years now. My career started as a systems engineer working for EDS, so I left university, trained up as, as a software engineer. I then worked for Philips Electronics for ooh, seven years, um, initially as a developer, then as a solution architect and a project manager. And those are really the two hats I've worn for the last 20 years. So through Philips, I went for a friend Provident for six months helping rescue a failing online pension system program, got that live, worked for a company called Connaught where we were growing enormously and it was in the B2B space, lots of interesting technology projects there. Then Clarks for six or seven years as their VP of global digital technology, e-commerce, so I spent a lot of time there growing the business from one relatively small multi-channel website to trading globally around the world, lots of platforms, lots of re-platforms, lots of fun and challenge. And then I decided a couple of years ago to, having worked with many of the systems integrators and built many in-house IT teams and bits and bobs, to try leaping over the other side of the fence. So I joined Deloitte. Uh, and for the last two years, I've been helping clients at Deloitte, uh, A, get the most out of Deloitte, having been an ex-client, I think that gives me quite an edge there, and B, try to land some, some successful e-commerce replatform, replatforming projects. My relationship, if you could say it, with Derry. So I've been working with, with Skyvism for seven, eight years now, I think it must be. So uh, when I joined a previous company and discovered the e-commerce platform I'd inherited wasn't performing correctly and the team in-house hadn't successfully nailed how to scale the platform, I was at a bit, slightly bigger sort of e-commerce event, saw Derry on the stage and... Um, got his number and the rest is history. So I've worked with Skyvism for eight years. I think it is since then as a low test partner, both as a client and also when I've been working within Deloitte, also with some of my clients working with Skyvism. Uh, also using the services to, uh, to monitor the websites as well. So there's some pretty awesome capabilities there I've been very impressed with. So the, I've got four themes I was going to talk about today and they're really only to give you guys some um, inject some enthusiasm, not some enthusiasm, some ideas into the room so that when we have the, the round table event after I've spoken, there's some ideas that you have and you start thinking about your own context. So it's really just to get the thought juices going. And it's all about either replatforming an e-commerce platform or launching for the first time. From my experience, replatforming is more complicated, but launching a new e-com platform from scratch is also pretty darn complicated. So there's four topics I was going to cover. One is what I call the iceberg. Next one is um, how to choose an implementation partner. There are lots out there, there's some really good ones. The trick is finding the right partner for you based on your context. How to shape your project and then how to go live successfully. So the iceberg. I've seen a few times now uh, and, and helped clients through this as well. You're in a business, you think you're going to launch a new e-commerce platform, you go out and look at the, the platforms out there, the demand wares, the hybrises, the ATGs, etc. You make your choice, you then start realizing there's a bit more around it, um, and you kind of lay out your stall in terms of a project, a plan, a budget, you partner with somebody, you choose your partner, probably based on that technology as well, and their experiences. And then quite often what folks miss is that is really only the tip of the iceberg of the technology you have to put your arms around when you're going to launch a new e-commerce platform. So the, kind of the bit under the water are things such as your back office ERP systems, your finance systems, your warehouse systems, and integrating with those, pretty darn complicated. And then the other is um, the various SaaS systems around the edge that you have to start understanding, selecting, procuring, and integrating with. So whether that's a payment service provider, an image delivery system like Adobe Scene 7, a, a CDN, an address lookup engine, there's about, there's about 20 of them, uh, and, and the ecosystem just grows to be this enormous, enormous lump of your e-commerce platform, but all these other things around the edge, your company's back office systems you're going to have to saddle your e-commerce platform to, and a whole host of really complicated integration. And that for me is the iceberg, and, and very often these projects kick off and miss the point that you're going to have to put your arms around all of that, very often. So my tip is to understand the iceberg before you get going. Face into the full scope from day one, um, and from a 
the other bit that's often missed is the business teams. So these programs are very often tackled as IT projects. That's kind of not okay. What you're doing is launching a new business or relaunching a business on a new platform. It will have impact to the, the business teams. It will have impact to your customers and your consumers. And very often these things are led by the IT functions and the business teams are kind of to the sides. The successful projects that I've seen are where the business and the IT teams are joined at the hip, doing this together. One or other might be dominant in terms of leading, but the, the, the business teams need to be in from day one, building up their plans around how they're going to build their content, how they're going to get their staff skilled up, um, and not leaving it too late. Quite often it's left too late, and then you realize you've got several months worth of prep, and the IT team might unusually be ready before the business teams are. So right up front, that has to be thought through. Another tip is reducing the iceberg, the ecosystem. So very often when you get going with these programs and you're engaging your board and your execs and you're thinking about an awesome customer experience, um, the kind of the iceberg and the complexity just grows and grows and grows. And it's quite hard to then have a conversation about a minimum viable product. Getting this thing live is more important than getting it perfect on day one. Um, I think the trick is to simplify some of the stuff around the edges, which is complicated but not gonna impact the customer experience and get the magic a uh, sprinkle of fairy dust over the top that makes the, the customer experience awesome, but simpl simplifies some of the back office processes and things around the edge that really could be added later. Um, you will find that you're just going to delay and delay as the scope grows otherwise. So it's really hard, but from day one, have a conversation about what is the minimum viable product you can launch that's going to be okay from a business perspective, and then bolt on things afterwards. Bolting on things afterwards brings me on to the fact that these platforms, once live, are living beasts that are going to continue to need to be um, nurtured, grown, as Derry said, bolted on, morphed. The investment, the, the budgets required to keep these things going is substantial. Quite often businesses will have a big budget to go live and then assume it's going to run. The reality is you're going to have development on these platforms going on forever more and therefore facing into the fact that the cost of ownership of these platforms is probably higher than people might be used to compared to back office systems is, is a kind of a, a thing you want to get in up front and not have a nasty surprise later. I think if you haven't done this before, bring in an expert. And if you're about to select an expert and you're not quite sure which expert to go for, I mean that by that I mean systems integrators, for example, bring in an expert to help you select the right expert. It's worth its weight in gold. Data, data, data. So a, a, a team capability in these projects that's often missed is a data team. So I just talked about the ecosystem, the, the iceberg, and all these systems plugged together. The, you will often have developers and people that look at these different systems and are specialists in them. But having a team that's going to really understand the data, the love, sorry, the, the lifeblood that's going to flow between these systems, map the data, understand it, provisioning data across all these systems so you can test different scenarios, looking at data migration, again is something that kind of bites people in the bum a little bit later down the line quite often. So up front, think about data, think about skilled data architects, data engineers, and what sort of capability you might need in your project. Consider your delivery approach. I've actually got a, a section later on around go live, but too many of these projects go live as a big bang, particularly when you're replatforming. And the risk you're introducing to your business can be enormous, particularly when you've got an e-commerce business that's tens or hundreds of millions of pounds. So kind of going in with the assumption you're going to flip a switch is an enormous assumption and it, it does put the business at enormous risk. So investing up front in time and energy to think about how could you launch this platform in a way that it's low risk? How could you run it in parallel with your live platform right now if you're re-platforming? How could you do an internal launch? How could you, how could you, how could you? And kind of the last answer is just a big bang go live and no way back. That, that it does happen sometimes and sometimes it's inevitable. But Really think up front about how can you go live in the lowest risk way possible. Particularly when you've got a live platform and you're doing more things, iteratively delivering chunks of work, getting it live, getting it working is much better than a big bang later on. My last point on this topic is UX and CX should be king. So very often I've sat in rooms full of technologists thinking about how to create the most awesome lump of technology. Actually, you've got a customer at the top of this who's going to interact with your website or your app their experience should be king. So don't let your, I don't know, your finance team decide how they want their profit and loss reports to be created and how the product teams are structured to then reflect how the website looks and feels and your product catalog it feels. It's, it's nonsense from a customer perspective, but 
quite often it's very easy to look at an e-commerce website and, and figure out how the business is structured by looking at the site. <laughs> Honestly, that's, that's very often the case. So think about it from a customer's perspective. Do customer research, do um, usability testing, bring real people off the street and figure out how you can create this awesome customer experience and then how you can create the awesome technology to do that and then mesh the business around that to make it hum, not, not kind of the opposite way around. It's counterintuitive, but it's, it's often done that way. Okay, my second theme. So uh, how to select a good e-commerce implementation partner. So I've got here kind of four, apologies it's not on the screen, but four, four different themes and messages I've heard from customers and I've personally experienced at times as well when working with partners that you think, God, if I'd only thought about this a bit more carefully up front. So a few couple of examples are, my project's getting more complicated, the implementation partner doesn't have the scale, now I've realized that it isn't a hybris project or it isn't an ATG project, it's, a, it's this whole great big um, iceberg, this ecosystem we're trying to change and get live and plug into and test. So you know, really think about it up front, think of what you're actually facing into and therefore the right partner or partners capable of doing what you're trying to do. And it can be a combination as well, but don't just go for the best hybris partner because it's a hybris project, because you will sometimes miss the point. It's my honest advice. Make sure accountabilities are clear with your customers, sorry, with your suppliers, so you don't end up six months down the road pointing fingers. So spend time up front talking through with your supplier what you're going to do and what they're going to do. Another kind of practical bit of advice here in contracts is don't use races. I'm, I'm not a fan where you have great big tables with names and roles and accountable, responsible, and you kind of get into the thick of it and then you realize, well, that's pretty meaningless. So actually write down in plain English what your project manager is going to do, what their BA is going to do, what you're going to do. Plain English is the way to go. My dev partner says my UX partner ignored the e-commerce starter store. So there's a trick. The challenge when selecting partners is you could select a big partner that can do everything, but you might be swayed to think about combining a number of specialist partners. And both are valid, but think about it very, very carefully. So a thing I've faced into a couple of times now here are your brand team, your marketing team have got a, UX, a brand and UX agency. They're great. They know the brand. They love the brand. Brilliant. They're going to design the website experience now. But frankly, they know absolutely nothing about demandware or Hybris or ATG. And therefore, they will design this awesome experience that means you're going to have to rebuild Hybris. So I did either bring your... I say hybrid, hybrid demand where any of these platforms into the room with the UX guys up front to explain what the platform is capable of doing, what the starter store that those software vendors have built for you already is capable of doing, and how to mesh that to be a great on-brand customer experience, rather than just starting with a blank piece of paper. Or, even better, if you can find an integration partner that can do both, make them accountable for both, and they will deliver a, a more efficient way of delivering an awesome customer experience which leverages the platform that you've bought. So it's a, it's a pitfall, absolutely, to fall into, and quite a few have. I've uh, talked about getting independent expert advice when you're looking to get going. Um, again, decide the role of the, the partner. Have you got a very big in-house capable and experienced program management team? Do you just want a Magento expert in? Do you have a great big enterprise architecture and solution architecture team that are awesome? Or are you actually looking for a partner that can do all of those things? So that's, that's kind of the, before you get even open the door to any partners, think about what you really, really need and be honest about the in-house capabilities. Don't let price be the only thing that makes the decision because there are too many e-commerce replatform projects that have failed and have had to be re -res rescued a year, two years down the line and have cost many times more than frankly they should have done because the decision up front was to kind of squeeze the partner, go for the small specialist and everything else is done in-house and you find a year on that it's just not going to work. So yeah, be very, very careful what, where you, what you choose and how you figure this through. Have a long-term game plan. So again, too many of these projects get going, you bring partners in, and you just crack on with building this new e-commerce platform. And you don't think too hard about, in two years' time, do you want this partner to still be here and figure out how much they're going to charge you, or do you want to build an in-house IT delivery capability or an in-house UX capability? Do you want to have an in onshore team for the first couple of years and then find a lower cost partner later on? So have a game plan. Changing your game plan in two years' time is just hugely disruptive. It takes a year or so to kind of recover. So really have a game plan. And it, 
It makes a huge difference to the peop your people on the project if they know where they're going with their careers as part of this project. And if you're investing in them as part of it to build your own in-house team, then have a plan around that from day one, measure yourself against it and succeed. Too many of these projects just blindly continue and, and, and never really find an end goal. And then everyone puts their arms up in the air and says this costs too much, which is yeah, kind of inevitable. Talked about business or IT led, it has to be both. Um, yeah. <laughs> Bring in an expert when it comes to specific topics. So load and perf test is one perfect example. There are a couple of others as well. Um, maybe usability testing, other odds and sods where actually a niche expert is going to be needed on the pitch. So plan for that from day one. Um, check what the skills of your partners are, but assume you're probably going to need a couple of experts and budget for them as well. Talked about clear accountabilities. This is an interesting one. So having jumped over the fence over the last couple of years from being a customer to being a supplier now, I'm a huge fan of um, before get going with a project with a customer, your customer asks you in to their offices to understand their team plans, how they're going to build their capability, who they're putting on the pitch to be the business analysts or project managers or integration team or whatever, and get your key partner to sign off that they agree that your plan around people, skills and partners is spot on. Too many times partners come in, business and IT teams have got their own plans, they bring a partner in, they contract with them, six months down the road everyone discovers that the in-house team just didn't have the skills and knowledge, were a little bit ambitious and perhaps they built a whole load of recruitment plans to bring people in and it, it fails. So get your partner to sign up with you as to your plan as well as theirs around resourcing, skills, etc. Okay, so that's the second theme. Two more to go. Uh, how to shape the project. So these are kind of pains that I've heard or experienced at the top as well. So we left testing the ecosystem to the end. So the trick here is when constructing your e-commerce platform, don't leave all of your testing to the end. It states the obvious, but don't leave it to the end. Don't leave plugging all the bits and pieces together till the end. Create a number of iterations through your plan. Um, I could talk about an example with a Hybris project, just as an example. So um, with Hybris, Hybris, the core of Hybris is the PIM, the Product Information Management Engine, where you pump prime it with product data from your back office systems and you enrich that product data. So you know what? That as a kind of as an epic is a fantastic example of the first thing you do when you've got your technology stood up. So plug your back office system in through your integration layer to Hybris and get your business users to validate that product data has flowed through and is in the PIM, in the screens, and they can manipulate it, and that the system is stable and working. And you've spent about 10% of your budget at that point, I make the number up, but you know, an iteration, and you've proved out that your technology stack is stood up, plugs together, data's flowing, is stable and is operational and you move on to the next thing and you build up your system like that through iterations. Too many projects leave the e-commerce team often a cupboard to design on paper with the other teams what's going to be the end state and go away for a year and the back office teams go away for a year and you plug it in at the end and realize you've got another year to go to get the darn thing working. So pull forwards as much as you can, build, test and proving out so that you don't have a big nasty surprise at the end. You, you can predict where it's going and if you have issues, for example, around connecting systems together, you know within a few weeks or a few months. You don't find out in a year and a half's time. Um, another one would be you want to roll out internationally, but you've realized that you've designed a system which isn't capable of doing that. So I'm going to jump onto my, 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 top, my tips because they're here. So have a North Star. So as a business, write down where you think your business is going to be in three or four or five years' time. As an, and the architecture team, understand that and start writing down some key principles as well. Use those things to sound off your design of your system against. So for example, if you know in the first year you're going to launch a UK website, but in the second year you're going to launch into another market, make darn sure that you've designed the system to be capable of doing that. Or acknowledge the fact that you haven't and you've got a great big project around the corner to internationalize your platform afterwards. Don't make it a surprise. The same goes with apps, for example. If you know you're going to have clienteling apps in the store or customers with apps, then build your system with APIs exposed from day one. Don't just focus on the website. Focus on the system and the architecture and make sure that the roadmap is something that you can get to rather than every year having a conversation with the board about however many millions of pounds you're going to need to refactor the system again to make it capable of doing the next thing. So think, have a game plan. It's a theme. <laughs> um, we talked about building iteratively and testing early. 
don't underestimate some of these topics. So non-function requirements is one that people don't like to talk about. Too many times I've seen IT teams asking commercial business teams, what are your non-function requirements? <laughs> and it's a bit of a silly question. The technology teams will know examples of those, will probably know what the right answers were, are already, need to sit with the commercial teams and explain and get people to sign up to these. So by that I mean, what is your peak traffic going to be on Black Friday? Um, when are your back office systems going to be live? When are your business teams going to be merchandising? Are they going to be doing it at midnight when your site's busy? Or are they only going to be doing it during the working day? How are you from a PCI compliance perspective? How secure does the system need to be? All these things will change the way the system is built and designed. And they're fundamental. So get those on the table up front right at the start. Don't leave it till it's too late. There'll be lots of rework. Maintain a roadmap. So business objectives change, projects change. Keep that roadmap and that North Star current so that the team is always knowing where they're heading and building the system and building the customer experience in a way that will take you towards that. Senior sponsor. So find your sponsor in the business. Are they on the board? Are they chief operating officer? Are they the chief marketing officer? Who are they? And if you're the program director, have a weekly one-to-one -one with them. Don't wait till your quarterly steering groups or your monthly steering groups. Have a one-to-one -one conversation with them. Don't hide what's going on in the program. Be entirely open book. Talk about politics, people, budgets, and everything, and you'll get their support. So find that person and, and hook into them pretty quickly. Regularly engage the broader business. These projects too often go away for nine months and come back. So the broader business isn't aware of what's going on. Perhaps plans have changed elsewhere. Email campaigns have changed. Install experiences have changed. Make sure the business is engaged and knows what's going on. Uh, we talked about the business and IT mix. It's, it's one team. It can only be one team. Um, another trick that's missed. So platforms such as ATG, Hybris, etc. Really, Hybris, I'll talk about Hybris as an example. Release an update every quarter. And um, they're usually minor releases, and every now and again there's a big, a big release. You as a business have invested in whichever platform you're using, you're paying subscriptions to it, you're paying support and maintenance to it. There are loads and loads of features that are built into those updates all the time. Too many projects take the version that's current when they start the project and stick with that for a year and a half. The right answer is to keep a very BDI on those updates and plan to do at least a couple during your project and afterwards. Otherwise, you fall off a cliff, you end up two or three years later in a version which is unsupported and with a multi-million pound project to update and upgrade with no real business value. So plan to update regularly. Leverage automation from the start. So um, this comes from the start of development from day one. Make sure you're using automation, automated test scripts, automated deployment and your operational IT team understands that, and you've got a way of pushing the, system, the code all the way through your system environments, and you're testing it. So when it comes to user acceptance testing, it's more of a validation rather than coming up with hundreds of bugs because the quality is so low. Um, and if you make a change in development, you can push it through and test it very quickly through into production. So invest in automation from day one. And make sure your operational teams are involved from day one as well. Don't wait until you're ready to go live to then just lob it over the wall to the team that's going to have to support it. It's going to be up day and night, weekend. Involve them from the beginning of the project. Make them invest time into how you're designing the system because they are responsible for supporting it. So they are actually another customer alongside your business teams, alongside your external customers, who should be putting on the table their demands and their requirements to make sure this thing is supportable and isn't going to be unsupportable when it goes live, because it's not a good idea for anyone. OK, this is the last one. So go live and what follows. So we talked about Big Bang Go Live and tried to avoid that already. So be very critical what must be in for Go Live. We talked about the minimum viable product. Avoid Big Bang Go Lives. Practice cutover. So your Go Live night, weekend, morning, however it's going to be, is really complicated typically. Normally, you'll have a cutover manager person with a thousand line plan that's going to coordinate all the business and IT activities to flip the switch. Practice it. Practice it as many times as you need to prove that it's going to succeed. Don't wait till the go live night to find that copying your customer data from your old platform to your new one is going to take three days. And if it is going to take three days, have a phased cutover, have a way of moving the data and merging it before. These are all real examples. <laughs> data migration. So don't be the person that finds on day two that all of your customer postcodes are one-off and you've, everyone has inherited somebody else's postcode. Just an example. Test this stuff. Test it inside and out. 
and build it into the plan. So remember my first slide talks about data, data, data. This is a bit of that. So when you are replatforming, I guess this is less about when you're launching a new platform, but certainly when you're replatforming and you're a business that's turning over tens or millions of pounds a year, take an honest view with the business as to the impact of this new platform. So assuming there's a little blip in the conversion rate for a few days and you're on, you're on, and maybe you're even increasing the conversion rate is optimistic in the extreme. The business teams will have to get to grips with trading the site, with merchandising the site, with really kind of getting on their game. The IT operational teams, absolutely the same as well. There could be experience or system issues that just weren't caught despite all of your testing, your internal parallel runs and everything else. So take an honest view as to what, how it's going to impact the sales planning and build it into the business plans way, way, way before you go live. Make sure the CFO, the commercial directors, et cetera, are bought into the fact this is going to take a hit. And you know what? If it's an upside in the end very soon, that's great, but don't plan for it to be. Don't find yourself as the business and IT team that have just launched a platform being kicked because it's not trading better than your, new, your old platform two weeks after it goes live. That's it's just not going to happen. It's very unlikely to happen. So we talked earlier about the business activities. So there's, as you can see from these slides, always far too much emphasis on the IT team. The business teams have got a huge amount of work to do. There will be impact potentially to people's jobs when you're moving to a new platform. There will be change to business process. There will be potential recruitment required. There is a lot of preparation required in terms of planning content, data migration, SEO impact, marketing email impact, the list goes on communicating to your stores if you've got a store estate out there as well. So have somebody who is planning and managing the business activities hooked into this project as a core part of it. Don't let it be something on the side. Another expert expertise, so leverage your SEO expert from day one. So the way that your site, the site is designed, the way your URL structure is set up, the way your metadata is set up on the site is fundamental to building up a decent SEO kudos. It's a, it's a black art. There are people out there that get it, bring them into the room at the appropriate time to help you design this up front and to measure it as you go live and fine tune it. So plan for going live, once you're live, plan realistically. This is gonna be hard yards. When you're live, it's gonna be hard yards for some time to get this thing really humming. Plan, resource, budget for it. Put somebody on the spot to be your hypercare manager, ideally, who's gonna run daily stand-ups with your business and IT teams around how the site's trading, any system issues, driving decisions, driving priorities until this platform really gets to a steady state and the customer experience is at steady state. And the business teams have kind of got to grip with all the tools and are really humming with it as well. So this can take months, really can take months at times. <laughs> Avoid going live just before peak. How many projects get delayed and then you come to peak and you're like, oh my goodness, if we don't go live right now, we're going to be three months later in January or February before we can go live. Let's just go for it. So plan to avoid peak as much as you can. Don't plan to go live a month before if you possibly can, because it's bound to get, start getting delayed and it's bound to then knock against peak. So try and avoid, ideally go live just after peak. January's fine, February's fine perhaps. Depends on your business, depends on your trading plans. But um, yeah, avoid it like the plague. And plan how to operate once live. So the teams, the processes and the budgets, it never stops. So I guess I touched on that point earlier. Quite often there is an enormous focus on the project team and then the project team disappears. Your biggest systems integrators disappear and there are some people left holding the baby. So spend a lot of time thinking about who those people are, how it's going to operate and getting them ready and investing time and money and energy in getting that team and set of teams to a steady state and it will take months after you go live. And last, celebrate. These are really, 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 really hard projects. So take time out, take the team out for nights Meals, drinks, reward people, um, all that good stuff. It's, it's really hard yards and people will be motivated and will feel hugely at the huge achievement of getting these sites live once they're live, but keep them engaged throughout, particularly when things don't go right. There you go. That's my, uh, my little Bible. <laughs>